Hi, welcome to Feed Your Soul. I am Melinda and you are watching our series on the Torah portions. This is where we believers in Jesus or Yeshua, which is like his more Hebraic name. This is where we learn more about the front of our Bibles so we can really understand uh, the Bible better than we do. How often do many of us Christians um, know the Sunday school stories, right? We know the themes, we know um, the, the children's Bible version of what goes on in these first books of the Bible, but do we really know the, the biblical context? Do we know the historical context? Do we know how these stories really actually make the foundation of what the rest of the Bible was built on? I love diving in to the word to look at the deep and meaningful richness of the, the words of our creator. Um, so I'm glad you're here. If you're new, please check out the playlist, uh, Torah studies. We've been doing this since the fall. We're about halfway through. We're in the book of Leviticus chapters 12 and 13 today. It's a shorter portion, though chapter 13 is quite long. Um, it's usually paired with next week's portion. Um, but we're separating them out this year because it's on the rabbinical calendar. At least it is, there's a leap month. So it makes it a little bit longer. We have a few more weeks to work with. So Leviticus 12 and 13, that portion is called Tetria and it means conceives or um, become pregnant or more literally like bear seed um, for reproduction. We're also going to look at second Kings chapter five and Luke chapter 17 in the new Testament. Um, if you do have kiddos around, there might be some subject matter here that might not be something you're ready to discuss with them. Um, we're getting into some of the uh, ritual cleanliness laws. And so we have to talk about what that entails. Um, so if you have kids in the room that don't know about this kind of stuff, um, you might want to watch this when they're not around. We'll, we'll try not to be too explicit, um, but we got to talk about what the Bible talks about, right? So let's get started. Leviticus 12. Then Yehovah said to Moses, say to the Israelites, a woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be unclean for seven days as she is during the days of her menstruation. And on the eighth day, the flesh of the boy's foreskin is to be circumcised. The woman shall continue in purification from her bleeding for 33 days. She must not touch anything sacred or go into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are complete. However, if she gives birth to a daughter, the woman will be unclean for two weeks as she is during her menstruation. Then she must continue in purification from her bleeding for 66 days. When the days of her purification are complete, whether for a son or a daughter, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting, a year old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And the priest will present them before Yehovah and make atonement for her. And she sh shall be ceremonially, ceremonially cleansed from her flow of blood. This is the law for a woman giving birth, whether to a male or to a female. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she shall bring two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. Then the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. So that was a short chapter um, and there's a lot there. There's a lot there that I don't even think I'll be able to help give insight on. Um, I've done a lot of reading on this chapter. This chapter introduced uh, a concept that it didn't really define and it will find that I think it comes up again, I wanna say in Leviticus 15 about purification of um, a woman's menstrual bleeding uh, and what that state is and so it like used that to kind of define this state of giving birth um so we'll talk more about that then so if, if you haven't heard of this before um there is in i believe leviticus 15 um a law that talks about it comes up through a couple of chapters exactly that where it's all fleshed out i can't remember right this moment but in the next few chapters in leviticus 
um, the law surrounding when a woman is bleeding during her period, her menses, it's called nida or nida in, um, in Hebrew. Um, when she is bleeding, that there is a law, there are laws around that and about coming in contact with that blood and sexual relations during that time, um, that it's prohibited during the time of her bleeding. And then it gives like special circumstances if she's bleeding longer than her, her seven day, um, set apart time, um, you know, that would infer that there's an illness or a miscarriage. So then there's other special, um, directions around that. So there really is an expectation that when a woman is bleeding, um, she is not to be having sex according to, to the Torah. And it's using that as kind of a definition um, of what this time period right after birth is like. And then that it actually extends either um, to a, to 40 or 80 days total, depending if there is a boy um, or a girl that was born. So this is super mysterious, right? And, and I've read a lot of commentary on the subject and I'll tell you, much of the commentary ranges from just kind of unhelpful to a little bit offensive. Um, and none of it really spoke to my spirit as being like, yeah, the, the, these people have got it, right? Um, it, it's a hard thing to speak on. Um, why, right? First of all, what about giving birth makes a person um, unclean? And then why is there sin offerings being brought an atonement being made, right? So it's, it's a, it, like I said, it's a little bit mysterious, but I'm hoping I can help bring some kind of clarity. I know I won't answer every question, but I want to be able to bring some kind of insight to this time period. So as I'm reading through all this commentary, I see some differing opinions on what it even means, right? There, people are trying to come up with the why, but even the like what is, is really uh, debated as well. So this time period, where it is somewhere, uh, it was 40 to 80 days total, whether you a boy, um, there's these specifications for 40 days. And if a girl is born, there's this specification for 80 days total, but they're split up, right? If a boy is born, it's one week of this time like menstruation where a woman um, would just be treated the same as, as if she were menstruating, which really is just stay home, relax. There's marital relations are not allowed. Your body is resting and recovering. So that's really clear that during that week, that's what's happening. And during the two week period, if it's for a girl, um, the debate is about the rest of the time periods, um, the 33 days or the 66 days respectively. Um, and what happens during that people debate whether that continues the marital relation restriction continues that whole period of time, or if she just can't go to the, um, the tabernacle. So different depends on the different um, group in, in Judaism. They kind of argue about that. Um, I know that that time period, it's roughly six to 12 weeks, but that, um, that really does mimic our, our modern medical advice to women post-birth that they abstain from marital relations somewhere from six to 12 weeks. It's six, you know, some it's, it's rough, you know, it's not like, um, a commandment, right? But that's kind of the recommendation is things take about that long to heal up. Um, so, and, and a little closer to 12 weeks if there was trauma or, or, or extra issue during the birth. So again, those are debated. Um, I would submit that a woman can bleed well beyond one to two weeks after giving birth. So it would make sense that um, there would be abstaining the whole time there was bleeding because that is what is kind of consistent with the rest of the word. And um, yeah, so I don't think it's just the one or two weeks that a woman is supposed to abstain um, after birth. It's not enough time usually. Uh, okay, so then that was like what I came across in my reading as it kind of um, conflicted with one another. Karaite Jews, not even all Karaite Jews, they believe that the whole time period is to abstain from marital relations. Um, uh, other groups believe the opposite. Anyway, so then there was all this kind of commentary on the why, 
right? Why are women staying away from the tabernacle? Um, that's really the question. I think we can understand why marital relations would, would need to stop, right? I think we can all figure out why that would be a good idea, um, especially when you look ahead at the chapters, um, 15, 16, later chapters in Leviticus, um, about the time of blood for a woman. But the why is the question, right? And so we have these two words that come up all through these chapters. Um, it's tame and tehor. And these are the words for unclean and clean. And they're confusing. <laughs> clean and unclean don't give us, it's like, that's a circular definition. Something that's clean is something that's not dirty. Something that's unclean is something that is dirty, right? So it's like the same circular definition that doesn't really help us understand being in this state, having given birth, having a period, none of those things are inherently wrong right? This is not a wrong thing. So being unclean isn't being wrong or sinful in a way where we tend to use the word where sin is like negative, something um, evil, right? There is a sin offering brought. So it's something, right? There's some kind of human condition that takes us off the mark. We learned before that sin is, is something like missing the mark, Right. So a woman who's just given birth is somehow missing the, the, the goal of where God wants us to be for ultimate connection. OK, um, so I'm saying clean and unclean is not a great use. It's not great definitions of these words. I would submit that it would be something closer to having a connection to death or being more connected to life. And if we remember way back in the garden, there was no death. There was only connections to life. So we're going to talk more about the garden in a minute. But if, if you look and you see where this word unclean comes up throughout scripture, it is often about something related to either directly or indirectly to death or illness or, or something that is just not life. Um, we see it in, in, in having to deal with a dead body. Someone dies and needs to be buried. There is nothing inherently wrong with having to bury a dead body. But if you come in contact with a corpse, you are then considered unclean. And then steps need to be taken um, and time needs to be waited. It all depends on the specific issue, but there's a time issue involved. And there is um, often some kind of a, a sacrifice or ritualistic thing that needs to be done in order to come back into the tabernacle and approach God, right? Um, so I believe this does take us back to the garden. When we want to think about these laws and what they mean, we have to think about a time where we didn't need these laws but still there was closeness with God. So we can think about the man and woman in the garden and how they were able to have a close and personal relationship with the creator. And they didn't have to worry about being ceremonially unclean. Um, Tame and Tehor weren't introduced at this point in time. So why, what was different? One thing I did come across in a lot of the reading were ways to kind of connect this waiting period of um, being different for having a boy or having a girl, it was oftentimes connected back to Adam and Eve in different types of commentary and stories. And even in the book of Jubilees, we've, we've talked a lot about the book of Jubilees on this channel. In the book of Jubilees, it talks about Adam and Eve being created outside of the garden, which we know Adam was placed in the garden. Um, Adam was made on day six, the first week. And then according to the book of Jubilees, Eve was made on day six, the next week. Um, and Adam had to wait 40 days before he was placed into the garden and Eve waited 80. And this is what the book of Jubilees says, um, clearly connected to this chapter 12 in Leviticus, um, that there was a period of waiting, a period of purification before either of them were brought into the garden. 
Um, it doesn't really tell us why, right? Why was it different for, for Adam and, and Eve? But there is a connection that I see throughout commentary um, about trying to pull this Leviticus 12 back into the garden. Um, so closeness with God requires the state of being that Adam and Eve clearly had before the fall, right? There was a closeness. But once sin entered into the relationship, once Adam and Eve ate from that tree of knowledge, there was, death was introduced. Yehovah said, in that day, you will surely die. So death in some sense was introduced. Adam and Eve didn't die literally that day, but something was introduced. I believe it was probably the idea of like cellular death, right? That like there whatever bodies they were created with, the perfection, um, maybe they were incorruptible at that point in time, they corrupted, right? They, they corrupted their immortal bodies or they corrupted what they were made as. Um, and they introduced death into their being and into the world. And so that became a really serious thing where God sent the angels with a flaming sword to keep Adam and Eve separate from the tree of life. So there was now a separateness that they couldn't come as close to God as they were before. So whether this is, you know, a, a physics issue, right? Like being with this being in such a close way was, it seemed like it was dangerous for humans. And as we see the tabernacle get built, um, we see that as well, that there is this this need for separation, you know, on your screen is a picture of the Holy of Holy of, of the, um, of the Ark, right. Where God's spirit, God's presence spoke from the 10 commandments were put inside of it. Um, the book of Psalms calls these commandments, a tree of life. There are definite connections here. And when God gave directions for the tabernacle to be built, it, there was very specific directions on how the place where God would dwell, how it would be constructed, what materials, where it would sit, who was allowed to come close, when they were allowed to come close. There was a separation because death needed to be away from the giver of life. Again, we're not going to answer all the questions because we don't know exactly why, but we know what is. And we know that things connected to death and dying are not permitted like in the holies, uh, holy of holies, like not permitted in the sanctuary, not permitted in the tabernacle. So any of these laws that have to do with clean and unclean are all about, can I approach this physical presence of God in the tabernacle and the state that I'm in? That's it. Not am I bad? Not am I good? Not am I holy enough, meaning like, did I, did I do well enough in my behavior yesterday? It's, it's not that at all. It is a state of being that humans cannot help. Women cannot help the fact that they have a monthly menstrual cycle that causes them to bleed. That is not bad. God said to go and multiply, right? This was part of how the people needed to live but they needed, to, I, I had used this phrasing in a video before that God, God and the people were close in relationship, right? But they decided to move away. They created a reality for themselves that was not good. So in this reality that the people had now made, God was going to provide for them as best he could in a reality of their own making. If they wanted to stay in the reality of his making, it would have been different, but they chose to like make a reality different than what God had in store for them. So in that God gave them what they could have to, to be, do as well as possible. He, he gave them clothing. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. I believe that's where the idea of human beings being procreators came into play that probably Eve didn't have a cycle um, in the garden because there wasn't going to be childbirth in the garden. So these things were introduced as the people were separated from God. 
just a state of being. What they needed to do to make life as good as they could in this kind of reality of their own making. But death, this death and destruction um, and things related to that needed to stay out of the tabernacle, away from God. It's when it's it's this life when when we are restored back into this um, this life giving space is when we're able to approach the tabernacle, right? So there was actually uh, it seemed like there were lots of questions on whether or not women were even able to be in the tabernacle. But since we're talking about this whole thing about how they're not able to come during this time of of purification, um, I think that answers that question. But once these things were restored, the time all of them cost time and some kind of ritual or sacrifice, right? Whether you're touching a dead body, having to bury a family member, or you touched an animal carcass, or there was blood from menstruation, or there was um, birth of a children, or there was, I'm trying to think of the other, um, uh, if there was uh, relations between a husband and wife, the, the seminal uh, release, it makes the man, have to do um stay away from the tabernacle until sundown and then there's there's either time that has to to go by or um a ritual that has to take place in order to restore the connection between god and the people and to put people back closer to this idea of being whole or or life, right? Closer to life, further away from death. Okay. So I told you I wasn't going to come up with all of the answers here um, because it's confusing, but um, I just wanted to, to, to help people who, who are new to this idea, who think like all of these clean and unclean laws, it's kind of looked at as, as you're dirty, not good enough. It's not that. Also, as I'm saying these things, I am a very big advocate. If you're new here to this channel, I am an advocate of walking out the instructions of God, even in the Old Testament, as best as we can. But let me clarify here, as far as it is up to us, we don't have a tabernacle. We don't have a temple. We have access to God, the Father, through the work of Jesus, Yeshua right? So we do not have an issue of a clean and unclean right now. There is no physical presence of God dwelling in a place like the ark now. So these laws, I'm not one that easily says they don't apply to us right now. These do not apply in the current state of our current world because of the work of Yeshua, because he is our high priest. He is the one going into the Holy of Holies on our behalf. These don't apply right now. So it'll be one of the few times I actually say without a shadow of a doubt that these there's no way for us to really walk these out right now. I think when we are able to look into the health benefits of, of some of these, when we look, you know, like abstaining from marital relations during um, menstruation, there's some really good reason for that, um, for, to protect the woman's body, um, to kind of decrease an expectation on her we can walk out those kinds of um, ideas, right? But there's not this idea of being ritually impure and then you have to stay away from your father because there isn't staying away from the father. Not right now, not in the state that we are in. And I don't believe that there's going to be a whole lot of clean and unclean in the kingdom come. I think our incorruptible selves will not be able to become unclean um, in eternity. So. These are, these were states of being that applied to when the tabernacle was on the earth, how people could approach God. And then that was really their whole usefulness. So Leviticus 13, we're going to talk more about something that's super mysterious. <laughs> and hopefully we can come up with some kind of insight and discussion about it. Okay. Leviticus 13. Then Yehovah said to Moses and Aaron, when someone has a swelling or a rash or a bright spot on his skin, that could become an infectious disease. And your Bible might say leprous or a leprous disease. 
he must be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons who is a priest. The priest is to examine the skin and the infection of his skin. And if the hair in the infection has turned white and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin, it is a skin disease. After the priest examines him, he must pronounce him unclean. If, however, the spot on his skin is white and does not appear to be deeper than the skin, and the hair on it has not turned white, the priest shall isolate the infected person for seven days. And on the seventh day, the priest is to re-examine him. And if he sees the infection is unchanged and has not spread on the skin, the priest must isolate him for another seven days. The priest will examine him again on the seventh day. And if the sore is faded and has not spread on the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is a rash. The person must wash his clothes and be clean. But if the rash spreads further on his skin, after he has shown himself to the priest for his cleansing, he must present himself again to the priest. The priest will re-examine him. And if the rash has spread on the skin, the priest must pronounce him unclean. He has a skin disease. Or your Bible might say um, he might, leprous or leprous disease. When anyone develops a skin disease, he must be brought to the priest. The priest will examine him. And if there is a white swelling on the skin that has turned the hair white, um, and there is a raw flesh in the swelling, it is a chronic skin disease and the pre priest must pronounce him unclean. He need not isolate him for he is unclean. But if the skin a disease breaks out all over the skin so that it covers all of the skin of the infected person from head to foot, as far as the priest can see, the priest shall examine him. And if the disease has covered his entire body, he is to renounce the infected person clean. Since it has all turned white, he is clean. But whenever raw flesh appears on someone, he will be unclean. When the priest sees the raw flesh, he must pronounce him unclean. The raw flesh is unclean. It is a skin disease. But if the raw flesh changes and turns white, he must go to the priest. The priest will re-examine him. And if the infection has turned white, the priest is to pronounce the infection, the infected person clean. Then he is clean. When a boil appears on someone's skin and it heals and a white swelling or a reddish spot develops where the boil was, he must present himself to the priest and the priest shall examine it. And if it appears to be beneath the skin and the hair has turned white, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a diseased infection that has broken out in the boil. But when the priest examines it, if there is no white hair in it, it is not beneath the skin and has faded, the priest shall isolate him for seven days. If it spreads any further on the skin, the priest must pronounce him unclean. It is an infection. But if the spot remains unchanged and does not spread, it is only a scar from the boil, but the priest shall pronounce him clean. When there is a burn on someone's skin and the raw area of the burn becomes reddish white or white, the priest must, must examine it. If the hair on the spot has turned white, and the spot appears to be deeper than the skin, it is a disease that is broken out in the burn. And the priest must pronounce him unclean. It is a diseased infection. But if the priest examines it and there is no white hair in the spot and it is not beneath the skin, but has faded, the priest shall isolate him for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest is to re-examine him. And if it has spread further on the skin, the priest must pronounce him unclean. It is a diseased infection, but if the spot is unchanged and has not spread on the skin, but has faded, it is a swelling from the burn and the priest is to pronounce him clean for it is only the scar from the burn. If a man or a woman has an infection on the head or chin, the priest shall examine the infection. And if it appears to be deeper than the skin, and the hair is yellow and thin, the priest must pronounce them unclean. It is a scaly outbreak, an infectious disease of the head or chin. But if the priest examines the scaly infection and does not appear to be deeper on the skin and there is no black hair in it, the priest shall isolate the infected person for seven days. And on the seventh day, the priest is to re-examine the infection. And if the scaly outbreak has not spread, and there's no yellow hair in it, and it does not appear to be deeper than the skin, then the person must shave himself, except for the sca scaly area. The priest shall isolate him for another seven days. On the seventh day, the priest shall examine the scaly outbreak. 
And if it has not spread on the skin and does not appear to be deeper than the skin, the priest is to pronounce him clean. He must wash his clothes and he will be clean. If, however, the scaly outbreak sp spreads further on the skin after his cleansing, the priest is to examine him. And if the scaly outbreak has spread on the skin, the priest need not look for yellow hair. The person is unclean. If, however, in his sight, the scaly outbreak is unchanged and the black hair has grown in it, then he is healed. He is clean and the priest is pr to pronounce him clean. When a man or a woman has white spots on the skin and the priest shall examine them if the spots are white and dull. If it is a harmless rash that is broken out on the skin, then the person is clean. Now, if a man loses his hair and is bald, he is still clean. Or if his hairline recedes and he is bald on his forehead, he is still clean. But if there is a reddish white sore on the bald head or forehead, it is an infectious disease breaking out on it. The priest is to examine him, and if the swelling of the infection on his bald head or forehead is reddish white, like a skin disease, the man is diseased and he is unclean. The priest must pronounce him unclean because of the infection on his head. A diseased person must wear torn clothes and let his hair hang loose. He must cover his mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean, as long as the infection as long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone in a place outside the camp. So leprous disease or leprosy or skin infection or skin disease, depends on what your translation came up with. It, it could say any of those, right? This was a lot of words about specific skin stuff and we're not done yet. Um, it's fascinating right? The word here for leprosy, um, it, it, it very well may not be connected to like modern leprosy, which is actually called Hansen's disease now. Um, this word leprosy was, uh, came up in the English translations back at is Jerome's like Vulgate, um, the Latin Vulgate translation came up with the word leprosy. So this, this is relatively new, right? This is not what ancient, um, Hebrews were calling this. It was the uh, uh, it comes from the word sara, meaning to scourge or to be like um, have open skin, and it really just means a skin disease, a skin issue um, that causes like openings in the flesh, and apparently it's contagious, right? There needs it's a contagious disease. Um, whether we would relate it to some kind of bacterial or infection today, I, I, it's hard to know. Um, sometimes leprosy seems what is called leprosy in the, in the English translations of the Bible. Oftentimes it's, it seems to be a judgment from God. We'll see in our um, prophet portion that we'll, we'll see that God, God says sometimes that he does things right? In order or allows things to happen in order to show himself, to show his power and what he is capable of. We see Miriam get struck with leprosy in Numbers 12 um, as a consequence for her behavior, um, gossiping, right? So we do see this used in a, in a really supernatural way at some times, um, but we also see this really like kind of mundane application of if someone shows up with it, they go to the priest. So the priest can evaluate, is it kind of a run of the mill rash or is it this specific skin disease that we're, we really don't know if it even still exists today? Um, was it a supernatural thing that happened? Was it a disease that they came in contact with that we don't really have anymore today? The, the description of it here in Leviticus does not seem to coincide with the actual, um, what current leprosy is. Um, again, that's Hansen's disease named after the guy who kind of figured it out, gave it a name. Um, so to, to just have that kind of in your mind, like modern day lepers or leper colonies, that that is not the same. It doesn't seem like it's the same as what's going on here. So it's a little bit mysterious people were to present themselves to the priest. There wasn't like a healing happening. The priest was not imparting healing. It was your body will handle this. You will be healed, but do we need to just 
isolate you for now so it doesn't spread. Um, it's what really the, the priest was judging. Is this this type of disease that we need to con be concerned about and, and put you in isolation? So before we move on to the rest of the chapter, I just wanted to stop and talk about like, why are these two chapters together, right? We, we did touch on the fact that probably a lot of this revelation came at different times and Moses put together sections of the Torah that um, kind of went together, right? He like probably put it together by subject. We don't know exactly how much was given at one period of time, but sometimes there are hints in the text. So why are these two pieces together? There are some connections, I think, with giving birth and this leprosy, this skin disease that's kind of mysterious, um, or at least hints about it. I don't know if we get the full picture, but there are some hints made about it in scripture. So we didn't talk about it when we had finished the, the first chapter, but why is pregnancy, um, why does it lead to uncleanness? At the end of the pregnancy, like well, the woman is pregnant, right? There is um, a baby. She is not restricted from, from going to the tabernacle. She is not considered unclean, um, or I like to call it like in this separation, right? Like there's like this separation and connection, this kind of idea of being closer to death and closer to life, right? She's not in that while she's pregnant, but it's when she gives birth. And then there's this connection that is made in the scriptures to this, this leprosy, this skin issue being likened to stillbirth. So in when Miriam is struck with it. Um, is it Aaron? I don't remember. I think it's Aaron who says, do not let uh, my sister be as one who is stillborn. Um, so connecting this leprosy to this idea of, of, of birth, um, but being a birth that really is a death, right? That's what stillbirth is. So why is a woman considered separated or closer to death when she gives birth. And, and there, I don't have a perfect answer on this. Um, there is this idea that first of all, an organ is released out of her. So there's the death of a part of her body, right? The, we women, we grow a whole extra organ. Um, in addition to growing a whole human, we have a placenta that develops. Um, so it's, it's an actual human organ um, that is there to help nourish the baby. Um, and that dies, right? That's shed. Um, lots and lots of blood cells are shed out of the, the mother's uterus. Uh, this whole lining that has been there for, for nine months, 40 weeks. So there's definitely cellular death and I'm a nurse. Um, so you'll hear me kind of think of these things in like a healthcare perspective. So so I think of like, there's a ton of like cellular death that happens in pregnancy, um, which at the end of pregnancy, not during pregnancy, it's all about developing life and multiplying the cells. And then at the end of pregnancy, there's this cellular death, right? There's also this idea of, um, it, there's a connection to, to the curse of having pain in childbirth. Um, there's a connection of loss right here. Like it's connected to loss. If you're a parent, especially if you're a mother, you know, from the moment you give birth, you are grieving this bit of loss of this connection you had with this living creature, right? It's like day by day. And sometimes you can't quite notice it, but there is this loss of connectedness. And so there's this grief that goes on all throughout motherhood, apparently <laughs> until they're old. Um, it's a part of you, right? We actually, women wind up with the DNA of our children inside our bodies. It's been found in mother's brains all over the body. Um, pieces of DNA that are of their children actually wind up um, in all parts of the woman's body. So there is this loss of connection um, in childbirth and there's this loss of life, definitely cellular, the loss of some cellular life. And there's just this idea of this um, mortality that was brought into life in the garden. Um, that this was not the intended way that God was going to be in communion with his people, um, but this is the way it is now. So again, <laughs> it's not all the answers. It's a little bit of insight that I have gleaned and how this is kind of connected to the skin disease, this 
leprous disease, whatever this is, that there is this loss of life. There is definitely cellular death, right? There is the parts of the body turning different colors. There seems, um, it, it seems like it can last for a long time, as we'll see in the next portion, um, in, in the next, in the profit portion as well. This, this state could last for a really long time, for generations even. Um, and it's cellular, cellular death, if nothing else. If it doesn't cause physical complete death, it is causing death in the body. Um, and so I think that that is, you know, we see some of these states of being, um, dealing with a, a person who's passed away, right? Burying them, um, giving birth, uh, having uh, a seminal ejaculation, right? All of these things really do, what do they have in common? There is cellular death, there is actual death. Um, some death of the whole life, the whole being and some is um, a partial death. And so I, I think that that is a good way to connect this clean and unclean for the vast majority of the animals that are considered clean. Uh, they don't eat other life. Um, there are a few exceptions and those become muddy like chickens or whatever, but for the vast majority of animals that are considered clean, they're eating plants. They're not eating other life forces, right? They're not eating other things with breath of life in them. Um, we can have a debate about chickens and clean and unclean. That's for another day. But um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of talk about this. I hope it makes some sense what I'm thinking of here, this cellular death. Um, tell me your thoughts on it. And we'll get into this last part of the clean and unclean laws for this week, um, which Kind of interesting. Oh, and so before we get started here in this, it, I'm using the Berean study Bible and it now replaces the word skin disease with mildew. It's all the same word. Um, this issue is an issue. It's this diseased state. It could be a skin disease. Apparently it can also be um, some kind of issue in fabric or um, in other kinds of like natural material, okay? So uh, Leviticus 13, 47. If any fabric is contaminated with mildew, same thing, this leprous issue, any wool or linen garment, any weave or knit of linen or wool, or any article of leather, and if the mark in the fabric, leather, weave, knit, or leather article is green or red, then it is contaminated with mildew um, or this mysterious condition and must be shown to the priest. And the priest is to examine the mildew and isolate the contaminated fabric for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest shall re-examine it. And if the mildew has spread in the fabric or weave or knit or leather, then regardless of how it is used, it is harmful mildew and the article is unclean. He is to burn the fabric, weave or knit, whether it is contaminated whether the contaminated item is wool or linen or leather, since the mildew is harmful, the article must be burned up. When the priest re-examines it, if the mildew is not spread in the fabric, weave or knit or leather article, the priest is to order the contaminated article to be washed and isolated for another seven days. After it has been washed, the priest is to re-examine it. And if the mildew article has not changed in appearance, it is unclean. Even though the mildew has not spread, you must burn it, whether the rot is on the front or the back. If the priest examines it and the mildew has faded after it has been washed, he must cut the contamination, the contaminated section of the fabric, leather, weave, or knit. But if it reappears on the fabric, weave, or knit, or any other le leather article, it is spreading you must burn the contaminated article. If the mildew disappears from the fabric, weave or knit or any leather article after washing, then it is to be washed again and it will be clean. This is the law concerning a mildew contamination in wool or linen or fabric, weave or knit or any leather article for pronouncing it clean or unclean. So we have the same word here, it's uh, tatsa, tatsra'at. Um, 
it's the same word used for leprosy or skin disease is the same word used here for mildew. Um, the Strong's like translation that's widely used but not always accurate says that when it's um, connected to skin, it's leprous skin disease. When it's connected to fabric or building, it's mold or mildew, right? So it's like a fungal thing when it's connected to a human and it's mold or mildew when it's connected to fabric um, or building material. I, again, we don't know. This is like best modern guess, right? There's this thing that could infect people, fabric and building material. Um, was it a catch-all term or not? We don't know. Um, but it was something that could spread. It was something that was harmful. It was something that needed to be quarantined and contained. And the priest was, it was his job to look at it and to, to be educated enough to say, this is what needs to be done. We, remember how valuable materials were, right? You couldn't just like toss the $5 t-shirt and go ahead and, and, you know, buy a new one. Material was really expensive. Um, and if it was made into a garment, um, it required a lot of work, right? So let's see if we could save the garment. Um, if it was unable to be saved, then the priest would be the one to make that decision. So We'll hear more about this in the next portion about when it's in um, walls of a structure, um, but it's all, remember these are all um, natural uh, materials, right? There were no plastics or, or there really were no non-porous materials at this point in time. So just think about it like that. Like there were no, um, everything was porous, right? So, so it, it makes sense why all these um, either fabrics or even building materials could be infected with whatever this leprosy is. So if you have any more insights on this section of the word, please drop them in the comments. Um, I'd love to continue this discussion. Um, it's a hard one to talk about. I feel like we don't have as, we might have more questions than answers, but I think that's okay. It's okay to think through the questions. So into our prophet pairing, we are in second Kings five. This actually does start a few verses earlier and I didn't put it in here. And now I'm kind of kicking myself because I wish I did. So if you're doing the traditional prophet pairings, go back to the end of chapter uh, five, uh, the end of chapter four, second Kings four. And it talks about just this um, feeding of the people. And it just, it doesn't seem to connect with this portion. Um, and so that's why I was trying to cut it down for time, but here I am talking about it anyway. It is, I forgot, you know, it's like sometimes when you, you don't read the, 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 these prophets, Kings, first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles and Samuel, they are all considered part of the prophets um, traditionally in Hebraic tradition. If you don't read these as much, you can kind of forget how much of the New Testament is really built upon these stories and, and, um, how much of it is really reflective of what has taken place here. Like it's also cyclical, um, Yeshua feeding the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes. We see, um, a foundational story there in second Kings four. So read that if you want to. Um, I don't think I saved any time by keeping it out, but that's okay. Uh, second Kings chapter five. Now, Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man in his master's sight and highly regarded, for through him Jehovah had given victory to Aram, and he was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. So same root word, this is Metzara, I think I'm saying that right, um, which just means the man who, the person who had leprosy, um, same skin condition, uh, that we're not sure exactly what it is. Okay. At this time, the Armenians had gone out in bands and had taken a young girl from the land of Israel, and she was serving Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would go to the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. And Naaman went and told his master what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Go now, said the king of Aram, and I will send you with a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman departed, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. And the letter that he took to the king of Israel stated, 
With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman so that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and asked, am I God killing and giving life that this man expects me to cure a leper? Surely you can see that he is seeking a quarrel with me. The king of Israel was like, who, me? Now Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. He sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Please let the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Then Elisha sent him a messenger who said, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and all your flesh will be restored and you will be clean. But Naaman went away angry saying, I thought he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of Yehovah, his God, and wave his hand over the spot to cure my leprosy. Are not Abna and uh, Par, Parpar, uh, Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not have washed in them and have been cleansed? So he turned and went away in a rage. Neiman's servants, however, approached him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored and became like that, that of a little child, and he was clean. Naaman felt like there should have been something more being done here, right? I do know that the Jordan is a very small river. It's very small. So it doesn't look like this great body of water. Um, and Neiman was like, couldn't I have just done this elsewhere? Why did I have to come all the way here? But he did it. He did what Elisha said and he was clean. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God and stood before him and declared, now I know for sure that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord, as Yehovah lives before whom I stand, I will not accept it. And although Naaman urged him to accept it, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much soil as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make a burnt offering or a sacrifice to any other God, but Yehovah. Yet may Yehovah forgive your servant this one thing. When my master goes into the temple of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my arm and I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may Jehovah forgive your servant in this matter. So he wants to take dirt with him so that when he ever has to make a sacrifice, it'll be on the dirt of Israel. So it's, it'll, like be, it'll be like being in the land of Israel, but he still has to go with his master in to this pagan temple and stand with him while his master is going to be the one bowing down and he will wind up bowing with him like in practice, but it sounds like not in his heart, right? So Elisha says, go in peace. He gives him peace in that. I think that's really cool. Um, go, oh, God sees your situation and he sees your heart. Go in peace. But after Naaman had traveled a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God said, look, my master has spared this Aramean Naaman while not accepting what he brought as surely as Jehovah lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and asked, is everything all right? Everything is all, is all right, Gehazi replied. My master has sent me to say, I have just now discovered that, the two, that two young men from the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill of the country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. But Naaman insisted, please take two talents. And he heard, urged Gehazi to accept them. Then he tied up two talents of silver and two bags along with two sets of clothing and gave them to his two servants who carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the gifts from the servants and stored them in the house. Then he dismissed the men and they departed. When Gehazi went in and stood before his master, Elisha, 
Uh, Elisha asked him, Gehazi, where have you been? Your servant did not go anywhere, he replied. I think that was a lie. But Elisha questioned him, did not my spirit go with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to accept money and clothing, olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman will cling to you and to your descendants forever. And Gehazi left his presence. He was leprous, as white as snow. Wow. So that last end of the story really adds a twist to it. But it seems like this, this servant, um, he went to accept payment, really, right? Um, and then lied about it. And Elisha was like, this is not about us. We are not being paid. We did not do this. This was all about Yehovah. And I think that this whole story here in second Kings really, we, first of all, we don't know the King of, of Rome. We don't know his name. I think you can figure out what King of Israel it is, but it's not, you have to do some really deep, like figure out who was King here when Elisha, you have to do some digging to figure out the King of Israel. Elisha was not taking payment. This was all about Yehovah. This was all about the God of Israel and, and the work that he can do. I think that's why Elisha didn't even want to come out to begin with. He sent a servant out to say, go wash in the river. Um, because this wasn't about what Elisha could do. This wasn't about some magical power that he had for healing. This was, this is what God said to do and go do it. And so we see this miraculous healing. We see the faith of this little girl, right? I have that here because that's kind of what I want to focus on. She was kidnapped and living in this house. Naaman seemed like a good guy. It's all relative, right? When we're talking about ancient um, Near Eastern morality, um, we can't judge it by today's standards. But so he seems like a decent guy. The, her mistress seems like a, a, a nice enough woman um, that took her advice to go to see the prophet in Israel, because her God could heal him. So we see this faith of this little girl. We see this disease, whatever it is, being miraculously healed because of faith, the faith of the little girl, um, the faith that Naaman had, and the faith of Elisha, of course. And so we just see this beauty in faith. And I just love that here in this prophet pairing. And um and that's really what it would take, you know, all throughout this portion, right? Here's these people needing to learn to live in a close relationship with their God. And it takes faith in honoring what he says, his commandments, his instructions. They needed to, just, they needed to honor him in faith. And faith is really believing without quite seeing, right? Being certain of what you hope for, sure of what you cannot see. That's what faith is. I love this little girl's faith. All right. That brings us to our New Testament pairing in Luke 17. First one, Jesus, Yeshua said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks will come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck and to be thrown into the sea than cause one of these little ones to stumble. Watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Even if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times returns to say, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. We see this connection, this thread of faith, right? And the Lord answered, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea. It will obey you. Which of which of you whose servant comes in from plowing or shepherding in the field will say to him, come in at once and sit down. Instead, won't he tell him, prepare my meal and dress yourself and serve me while I eat and drink. And afterward, you may eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because of what, he, because he did what he was told? So you also, when you have done everything commanded of you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. We have done our duty, right? So the, the, we see this connection here to what was just kind of touched on with Elisha and the other and the servant. 
we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. And I think, I think that's part of how this really connects to um, this previous portion. Um, Elisha was just doing his duty and he wanted no payment. He didn't even want to thank you, right? Verse 11, while Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered one of the villages, he was met by 10 lepers. They stood at a distance and raised their voices shouting, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When Jesus saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they were on their way, they were cleansed. When one of them saw that he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He fell down at Jesus's feet in thanksgiving to him. And he was a Samaritan. Were not all 10 cleansed? Jesus asked. Where then are the other nine? Was no one found except this foreigner to return and give glory to God? Then Jesus said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. I love that line, that verse. Jesus also says something similar to the woman uh, with the issue of blood. Daughter, your faith has made you well. I love that line. Our faith makes us well in such a deep and profound way. And I know that there have been some believers that have gone kind of off on that idea that your faith is what heals you, but just on a deeper level, right? When we're talking about healing in this metaphysical sense, our faith in the creator of the universe and his power and his sovereignty is what makes us well, what makes it go well with us. And I love that. And so this one, here's this kind of modern art version of this leper and Jesus. And this one came back to say, thank you. This person with this skin disease that is, again, we don't know exactly what it is. Is it the same thing that was showing up way back in um, Leviticus? It seems so because he's supposed to go show himself to the priest, right? So he's saying, you go get um, your follow-up so you can get cleared by the priest because he knows what to look for, but they were cleansed. They were well, and all glory was being given to the father. So this was a mysterious and strange portion. Um, we're really touching on these clean and unclean ideas where really it's this idea of separation and connection. The ultimate goal, the ultimate point of really all of this is to regain our connectedness with the Father, our connection with God. We lost it with sin in the garden and all of this kind of history of God interacting with his people is about getting this connection restored. And that's what we look forward to when the kingdom come, where the tree of life um, grows to give healing to the nations, right? Where that is what is in the midst of, of the city, where the power of God, where God's fullness and his presence is there. And we're able to interact with him in our incorrupted, incorruptible bodies um, that we put on after the resurrection. And so again, we just continue to pull the threads through from the beginning that's, we kind of, we do that each week. We try to at least, um, what thread are we pulling through from, from really way back, even in Genesis. And, and this one is the idea about connection with our God. It also is another thread we like to pull on is about our high priest, the priesthood, right? That we have a high priest currently right now going before the father for us so that it doesn't matter what state we're in. It doesn't matter um, how much, where we fall in that continuum of, of Tame and Tehor, but that Yeshua in his incorruptible resurrected body is the one who goes before the father on our behalf continually. So that's it for this week. Um, I hope that you got something out of it. Again, this was a tough one. We're going to go into a little bit more in depth to some of these um, subjects in the next 
portion. So stay tuned for that. If you have thoughts, ideas, things that I missed, I'd be happy to um, hear them and we can incorporate them in next week's portion. If you have questions, I don't know if I can answer them, but put them in the comments because if you have that question, probably someone else does too. And we can wonder and investigate together. Um, and if this was valuable, please like and subscribe and share and do all the things, interact with the video because it helps the channel grow. And Shabbat Shalom. This will probably be up right at the end of Sabbath. Um, I got backed up today. So if you don't see it on Sabbath, I hope you had a really good Sabbath and I will see you for next week's portion. Okay. Have a great rest of your weekend.